Good morning, Card Moon. It is RJ back with another video. Let's get to it. Random Mike Schmidt item for the day. A little bit of bling for you. This is from 2010, if I'm right, reading that correctly. Tops, triple threads. Uh, great little, very pretty card here, 12 of 18. Sticker signature of Mr. Schmidt. Uh, three different powder blue pieces of clothing. You can see, by the way, the stitching is oriented, that it's three different things uh, encased within that laser cut card that says eight-time home run leader. I was looking at this pretty closely before I did the video, and I found an interesting error. So let's read this together, shall we? All right, so on the back it says, from 1974 through 1976. So all total, that would have been three years. 74, 75, and 76. Schmidt won eight home run crowns and hit 93 more than any other player in the game. I'm going to guess that that's a typo and that it should have been 1986. That was the span in which uh, Mr. Schmidt won eight home run crowns and hit 19, 93 more than any other player. So I don't believe this was uh, ever caught. This is not like there was, this is one of those uncorrected errors. I'm not sure if anybody else noticed it, uh, but that's just uh, something interesting about this card as well. Uh, again, 12 of 18, sticker auto, um, but hey, it's a pretty card. My random baseball item of the day. Um, very random, but um, something I want to throw out there to the good, for the good of the order. Have here a baseball cap. This is a minor league cap uh, of the Trenton Thunder. Uh, I believe they're a Red Sox affiliate now, although they have switched a number of times to different teams. So don't quote me on that. They might be a Yankees farm team as well. Uh, but they're Trenton, New Jersey. You can see it's a storm cloud with a look of evil holding a lightning bolt as a bat, Trenton Thunder. The reason I'm showing this off is um, it's one of the things I do whenever I'm in a town, I'm away from home. If I can, if the wife will let me, because we're usually together traveling somewhere, I'll try to attend a baseball game in the city I'm in. And it's typically a minor league uh, city. Because uh, all the major league cities, you know, I've been to a lot of them. And uh, what I'm interested, I always try to get a cap. That's what my point is. Uh, I'm going to uh, Greenboro, Greensville, South Carolina, Greenboro, whatever that place is. I don't know South Carolina very well. Uh, but Greenboro, South Carolina, uh, at the end of April. And it just so happens that the home team is playing. And I will have the opportunity within my uh, schedule of being there, the reason I'm there. I will have the opportunity to break away and attend uh, one or more of the minor league games uh, going on. The home team is in town. It was like the uh, Greensboro Drive. I'm not sure if that means anything to the people down there in Greensboro or Greensville, whichever it is. Uh, but I will be able to pick up a new hat. And it's one of the things I hope everybody else gets a chance to do is to support the minor league teams out there wherever they may be. Whoever they may be, usually, I don't care where you live, you're usually within drive of a minor league team, if not a major league team. So I try my best to support the minor league teams as well. I've been to many, and I always make sure I get a hat. So I got a lot of minor league hats lying around the house. Just wanted to show that off. Today's trivia question. Prize today from 2021. This is... Nolan Arenado, Topps Gallery, the private issue. The private issue is is uh, numbered out of 250, so this is the 2021 Topps Gallery product. Nolan Arenado, perpetual uh, gold glove, perpetual all-star. I know that at one time Mike Schmidt actually said that he thought Nolan Arenado would supplant him as the number one third baseman at all of all time when um, when. Arnado's career is over. Don't know how many people agree with that sentiment, but Mr. Schmidt himself said it, so I will simply mention it. Uh, for this trivia question today, so that is the prize. Um, sticking with baseball card themed questions again. 1987 Donruss 
opening day product. Uh, just like Topps does an opening day thing. Donruss did an opening day set back in the mid 80s. Um, it was almost like a half set about a nearly 200 cards of the game's great players, okay? And Barry Bonds was in that set. Um, now, it's not Bonds' is rookie. Bonds' is rookie was the 86 release, although 87, um, he was a, he had a rookie card in many 87 sets, 87 tops famously. I, got, I know that uh, Jab's family is always trying to get more and more 87 tops Barry Bonds whenever they can, but Barry Bonds was featured in the 1987 Donruss opening day release. And of note, one of the more famous and valuable error cards is an error card featuring Barry Bonds. So the normal Barry Bonds card is a common card, but there is an error card that shows the, it's the frame, the text, everything about Barry Bonds, but the image is of a different player. Name for me the person, the actual person whose image is on the error card of Barry Bonds' 1987 Donruss opening day. Send me that person's name in an email. I will include my email in the description below, along with a repeat of the question. You'll have today and tomorrow to answer, and we'll pick a winner on Friday. Good luck to that. So, today, today I'm showing off one of my favorite sets the 1983 top set. Why is this one of my favorite sets? A couple reasons. One is, um, I like the design. It's a very cool design. I'm going to show off a basic card right now. This is obviously Cubs shortstop Larry Boa at the time, although he was a long time Philly. Take a look at his back right there. See, he just played. He just played his first year with the Cubs in '82. So your front has a uh, portrait or sometimes action shot of the uh, player. I always had this little circle insert here. Sometimes it was left, sometimes it right. It varied depending on the image that they had above. Color of the frame and the border and all this stuff was met, made to match the team. Cubs, kind of a purplish, bluish bottom, blue trim and text. And the back was this kind of orangish brown. Uh, typical tops, complete stats. And if there was room, a little, you know, interesting tidbit. Uh, bio, the born date, um, how he was acquired, vital stats, and things like that. So this is the Larry Boa card. This is the standard card of your 1983 top set. They had uh, pretty much the basic things. You had your team card. Uh, in 1982, they first, they finally went away from the team format and started doing this for a couple of years. Basically, it's the team checklist, but it 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 put on the front two the two league leaders. In other words, your ERA leader and your batting average leader. That's what they put on the front of your team checklist. And in this case, the Orioles had a pair of Hall of Famers on the front of their card. Eddie Murray had batted 316 that year, led his team. Jim Palmer had a 313 AR ERA, was the lowest on his team. And the back was just your checklist. So in 82, for the 82 tops release, they started doing this format. This is the 83 version. They were still cranking out the checklist, the big cards of checklists. Still did that for most of the 80s. Uh, always about, you know, seven or eight of these cards that highlighted the entire checklist of cards in the set. Still had the highlight cards from the previous year as the first six cards. In this case, Ricky shattered the uh, single season record for one year. That was in 1982. Billy Martin was the manager of the A's and told Ricky he could run whatever he damn felt, <laughs> whatever he damn well pleased. So he, he broke the ba he broke the mark of uh, stolen bases. I think he ended up with 130. They mentioned here that he uh, broke the mark with uh, 119, but he ended up, I think, like 130, 132 or something like that. Because, again, he just ran whatever he wanted. Interesting picture here. If you want to, if you're a set collector, or I should say, uh, if you are a player super collector, interesting image here. Uh, this looks like Cal in the background. I'm sure somebody out there knows this is Cal. Looks like Ricky is already leading off a of second base and is going to try and steal third. 
and you got Cal in his shortstop position, uh, inching over. He's cheating over to second base to try and keep Ricky honest. Uh, so you got two Hall of Famers on one card. If you're a person who collects that stuff, I just wanted to highlight out that out to you. I believe that's Cal in the background there. Would have been his rookie year in 82. And Ricky Henderson getting a nice lead. Uh, another common feature for Tops at the time was the all-star cards. And again, they typical design, but different color schemes. They swapped out the color schemes for your American versus National. So you got your Reggie Jackson here. The um, bottom field was a yellow field, but it was either green or red text for your National or American. The bottom AL or NL logo style was blue. And then the frame was either blue or red for the cards based on National League or American League. Um, this year, Topps decided to do manager cards. They kind of swapped that out. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Showing off four Hall of Fame managers here. Sparky Anderson, now with the Tigers. It actually had a really cool thing. If you're a Hall of Fame collector, it had his managerial record on the back. Here's Whitey Herzog, a Hall of Fame manager. Had his major league batting record there. And he was, Sparky did have one uh, year with the uh, Phillies. It just kind of, it, it didn't actually it didn't list the one year versus two years. It just kind of listed your major league and minor league totals because he had so many, so much managerial experience, which was different for uh, Whitey Herzog. He had just a little bit of major league experience and just a little bit of managerial experience at the time. Joe Torrey. Okay, there you go. His uh, batting record, his career batting record, and his his uh, uh, managerial record to date could fit on both cards. And then uh, Frank. Again, Frank had too many stats to fit on one card as far as playing, uh, but this was his managerial record at the time. So Tops went with uh, manager cards that year, one of the first times they did that. They also had league leaders, and I'll go through the league leader cards with you. He says, who was, who was leading the league at the time? Willie Wilson led the league, the American League, in batting, while Al Oliver did the same in National League. Home run leaders. Mr. Schmidt failed to lead the league in home runs that year. Dave Kingman took the title. Where was Mike on the list? He was third behind Dale Murphy and uh, Dave Kingman that year. And you had a tie in the American League. Uh, Reggie Jackson, Gorman Thomas of the Brewers. RBI leaders, Hal McRae for the America League, and uh, Murph and Al Oliver tied. Stolen base leaders, no surprise on this one, Ricky Henderson and Tim Raines. Victory leaders, Lamar Hoyt. People forget Lamar Hoyt even existed for the White Sox. He had a Cy Young year. One year is probably this year, if you consider. Steve Carlton, perennial all-star there. Uh, strikeout leaders, Floyd Bannister and Steve Carlton. ERA leader, where was Steve on the ERA leader? Because he didn't get his, you know, he didn't get the triple crown of pitching. He was a few runs too low because Steve Rogers had a great uh, ERA season. Then Rick Sutcliffe on the Indians at the time. And then your save leaders, again, no surprise, Quisenberry over the American League and Bruce Suta for the National League. So now I'm going to show off a couple cool cards for the. Uh, 83 set. If you did the 83, of course, your three rookies, Sandberg, Boggs, and Gwynn. My, my Boggs was very well miss, you know, off-center. Uh, the Gwynn and the Boggs were not particularly perfectly centered either. Uh, no reason to get these slabbed. Um, they're just part of my set. They go in the binder. A couple of interesting picture cards or interesting cards to talk about. Oop, sorry for the knock there, people. Hope you didn't get dizzy. John Denny of the Phillies. I just I just thought this was an interesting picture. I don't know if he was actually taken. They took the images on a cloudy day or something, or if they just made him stand in front of a screen or something. The the, the background here was just so weird to me. But John Denny would go on to have a Cy Young here for us in '83. Interesting here. I thought Steve Henderson in the out in the for the out for the Cubs in the outfielder, but he's so he's bunting in the batting cage, and they chose that as a picture that they should put on uh, 
the car. He's bunting in the batting cage, and it looks like it's spring training, as if this was a, a good image. Love this one, Jim Kern. Jim Kern just looks like he, he came, he totally stoned, and he walked in, he said, hey, guys, you, you guys do what? You're playing baseball? I, I like playing baseball. Can I join you? Do I, I could pitch, uh, I think. I mean, he looks totally stoned out of his mind, just wandered in there and he threw, hey, go ahead and pitch. This one I just laugh at, Rich Dower at second base. I'm not sure who 28 on the Yankees is, but he's sitting there right under him. And I always think to myself, he's like gonna, go, he's like gonna scream to Rich Dower, I got it, I got it. Try, try and get him to drop the ball. That one always made me laugh. And this one, I just love the name, Marvis Foley. I don't think I've ever met a Marvis in my life before. If you look back here and you find out where he was born, Stanford, Kentucky, and his home is Lexington, Kentucky, so that makes sense. If you take a look at the guy's picture, big guy. I've never heard the name Marvis before. I just thought that was an interesting thing. And then lastly, Tito Landrum. And uh, Tito Landrum's been around for a while, but I I was looking at his stats, and take a look at this, um, this uh, record of his. Um, is he's got a complete major and minor league record, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's a lot of time in the minor leagues. You know, uh, I hope that's in different um, levels because in 75, uh, 76, he was at Arkansas and then Tulsa. 77, Arkansas, then St. Petersburg. Uh, 79, Arkansas and Springfield. 80, Springfield and the Cardinals. 82, the Cardinals and Louisville. So Tito did a lot of jumping from level to level and team to team over the years. Uh, I, I guess it was worth it because eventually he stuck for a couple of years. Hope he had a good time doing it. Uh, but I loved looking at cards like that. You see some journeyman player and you just had to sit back and appreciate. And the last thing I want to go through with you is something else that Topps did in 1983 something called the Super Vet Card. I kind of wish they'd do this again. It's a pretty cool concept. So here is Jim Cott's base card, along with Jim Cott, his Super Vet Card. They were sequentially numbered in the set. The base card came first. The Super Vet Card of that star player came immediately after. And typically, it was a you know a quality player. Jim Cott was certainly a... Uh, borderline Hall of Famer at the time. Uh, took him a while, but he got in. And it showed him alongside his rookie image. So this is from 1959. He was with the Washington Senators at the time, which became the Twins while he was still there. So uh, Jim Cott, I don't know if he actually played in 83, although he has a card in 83, because he got his World Series ring in 82 with the Cardinals, and he might have just said that was enough. I got married. Let me, let me step down. But here he is in his 83 um, Super Vet card with tops. And on the back of the Super Vet card, uh, just milestone dates, um, the major league debut, length of service. You can see best season uh, ranking on certain lists and some highlights, what he did in his career. Uh, I'm going to go through every one of these. Uh, I think it's important. I apologize for the length of time we're already at. And we are going to go probably more than 30 minutes. And I, I don't think I ever go more than 30 minutes unless it's something crazy. So I apologize in advance. I'll understand if you want to drop off. But I'm going to hit every one of the Super Vet cards. So bear with me. And they're going to go in order. So that 59 was Cott's first year. The next player who has, has a lengthy career was uh, Kari Ostremski, forever with the Red Sox. Uh, Carl doesn't look too crazily different as he did before. Gaylord Perry starting in 62 with the Giants. Even then he looked old. I mean, he, he wasn't gray, but he just looked old, like he was in his mid-30s by then. Gaylord Perry with the Mariners towards the end of his career. I don't know if he was around much longer after that picture was taken. Tommy John of the Tommy John surgery fame, obviously, started in 63 with the Indians. It's interesting here, you could see 1975, 74, no, 1975 was the year he was out on the disabled list with Tommy John surgery, obviously, and he still had, he had a couple, he had three 20 win game, 20 win seasons 
after that surgery. So you can see why that was such a huge boost to pitchers, the ability to do that. It almost looks like they use the same image on his base card there that they did on the uh, Super Vet card. So, you know, thanks for uh, thanks for stepping up the plate and really working hard there, top guys. <laughs> I mean, really. Rusty Staub still playing at that time. He had started in 63. He looks young. Uh, young Irishman. I'm not sure if he was Irish or what. New Orleans. Maybe he was, you know, Cajun or something like that. Rusty Staub. With the red hair and that face. You think he's Irish or something. Joe Morgan. 63 with the Colt 45s. Interesting. Uh, didn't know if you saw it on the Rust Rusty's hat. He was with the Colt 45s as well. In his debut. Nice little, the old style Colt 45 uh, unis for Joe Morgan. Eventually went on to the Reds. Another 63 alum, Pete Rose. We all know Pete Rose with the Reds. Love that little classic Pete Rose rookie cut that he had for a couple of years before the mop top that he eventually sported for several years at the end of his career. Uh... 64 alum, Phil Necro. Another one of those guys, just like Perry, Phil Necro never looked young. <laughs> I'm sorry. If that's his rookie uh, picture with the Milwaukee Braves, he still likes. looks like he's, you know, in his mid-30s right away. So I'm not sure what's going on with Phil and Gaylord there, but a couple oldies. 64 alum, Louis Tiant with the Indians. Their super vet card, super vet card. 64 alum Tony Perez with the Reds. Tony with the Reds for most of his career ended with the Reds. But he was the Red Sox at this time of his career. Forever Oriole Jim Palmer, 65 alum. Always with the Orioles. 65 alum Tug McGraw. Got himself a World Series ring with the Mets in 69 and a World Series ring with our Phillies in 1980. Might be a trivia question. I look up and study who was the player who has the most rings, most World Series championships with the most different teams. That'd be an interesting uh, feat to figure out. Tug McGraw, super vet card. No doubt that these players should be super vets. When you're in the mid-60s and you're still kicking in 83, you did something right in your career. Bobby Mercer, long-time Yankee, but played with a couple other teams. Good friend of Mickey Mantle's when he first came up and to, the, to that at that point in his career. Um, they actually have a couple lesser-known players, like Lee May was not a, uh, a, a, a journeyman player. He was a star player for many years, Lee May. Uh, various teams. He was with the Reds early in his career. Astros, Orioles. Had a couple World Series rings. Ended with the uh, Royals late in his career, but he was certainly a quality starter. But as we get into these Super Vets, you'll start to see, you'll start, you'll eventually start seeing some of the play people they threw in there. You wonder why. So Steve Carlton, no doubt. Steve Carlton was a Super Vet, started in 65. His first year with the Cardinals. Interesting note, 65 is his rookie card. So, must have been the high-numbered set that they paid a rookie card of him. Fergie Jenkins, 65, with the Phillies. Love seeing old-style Phillies players in the Hall of Fame. Certain for, certainly, Fergie is known for the Cubs more so than any other team, although he did play with a number of different teams in his career. Reggie Smith, one of those borderline Hall of Famers like... Um, Al Oliver and Steve Garvey, as far as I'm concerned, borderline Hall of Famers. Reggie Smith is another one who should get some more Hall of Fame consideration. This kind of looks like Sandberg, but, you know, it could be any player at all. It's just uh, you see a Cub uni and you assume Sandberg, although it could be a Mets guy because I'm not sure if that's red or orange in that uniform. S Reggie Smith. Love this picture of Don Sutton. Don Sutton, super vet now. Uh, a lot of people know, I think, I want to say it's the 59 Don Mossy with the big ears. But take a look at Don Sutton's ears in this picture. Something tells me that explains why he started growing out that fro later on in his career. To hide those ears. 
good golly. Yeah, ever since, you know, mid-80s, like the 70s and whatnot, Don always had this big floppy, the afro going here, the, the jerry curl go, going. I swear it must have been to hide the ears. Super Vet 65, no, 66, Nolan Ryan. People forget he was up and down uh, for the Mets in his early career. In fact, he played two games in 66, but he was gone in 67, back to the minors. Came up again in 68, was there with them in 69 when they won. Uh, but Nolan Ryan, interesting, he's there. He's, he looks like he's called in front of the ball, but he's got one in his hand right there. Had moved to the Astros in the 80s. Sparky Lyle. Sparky Lyle with the Red Sox. Had a good career. A couple World Series rings with the Yankees. Uh, played for the number of different teams. He was on our 80 Phillies, but up and down, he, he did not have a lot of um, time with the Phillies in 80, and he did not make our postseason roster. I don't know if they gave him a ring or not, but Sparky Lyle. Super vet of 67. Rod Carew, another 67 veteran. Certainly deserves, these people still clearly deserve the super vet tag. But eventually, I'm going to get to a couple people. I'm going to start asking why. Reggie Jackson, no doubt. Interesting, 67 was his rookie year. He paid 35 game in 67. He was there the whole time in 68. But his rookie card is not until 69. So Topps really dropped the ball with the Reggie. Uh, getting Reggie as a card in, in a timely manner. You don't think of this guy being a, a veteran, but... Uh, Greg Nettles at the time, still with the Yankees, although he um, did have a couple great years with the Padres after this, and he started with the Twins, certainly looking like a wide-eyed rookie right there. Another 67 rookie. This is when they got it right. 67 was Tom, Tom Seaver's first year, and sure enough, his rookie card is the 67 top, so they scored well on that one. Tom Seaver with the Reds at this point in his career. He was not able to help them back to a World Series championship while he was with them. And they're going to talk about one Red. Let's talk about another. Johnny Bench, forever a Red. Here's another instance where he started in 67, but his rookie card didn't come out until 68. So uh, I guess he just didn't have enough playing time for them to warrant a card in that set. Al Oliver, like I said, I believe Al Oliver should be a Hall of Famer. 68 was his first year with the Pod Pirates. Certainly been around a long time. Certainly enough to warrant a Super Vet card. Here's a, here's a card you're not going to see too many of. Here's an image you will not see too often. Raleigh Fingers without the mustache. He started with the Oakland A's uh, back in 68. Or were they still in Kansas City at the time? I'm not sure at the moment. Uh, but there's Raleigh with the handlebar mustache right, winding up his career with the Brewers. There he is, rookie with the A's, no mustache. Hard to believe, Harry. Hard to believe. 68, Ted Simmons on the Cardinals. I don't think Ted Simmons' first card was until uh, 1970 or 71. And he played a couple years back in the 60s. Not just just a handful of games. If you see two games in '68, five in '69. So yeah, makes sense that he wouldn't get on a card until the '70s. Ted Simmons played all the way through the '80s. Here's where you get into these questionable people. Um, now they're old, so you know Gene Garber started in '69. Little known pitcher Gene Garber had a solid, if not spectacular, career. Journeyman pitcher. Saves, bullpen pitcher, as well as a starter in his career. A little bit of everything. Uh, did it all. A journeyman pitcher, but he warranted a super vet card from Tops for some reason. Similarly, so too did Dave LaRoche. Now we're into the 70s, okay? This is where I start to wonder why in the world did they put in these people as opposed to somebody else. So Dave LaRoche bounced around. He was a journeyman pitcher, nothing spectacular. You're never going to hear him... Uh, bantered around in Hall of Fame you know, discussions. Dave LaRoche will never <laughs> be a Hall of Famer. Gene Garber will never 
be a Hall of Famer, but here they are with Super Vet cards. And you get Dave Kingman, 71, started with the Giants, looking very young there. 71 with the Giants. I'm going to get through the last of these and start wondering, okay, well, what about this guy? What about that guy? I'm going to show you some other players who I think better warranted a Super Vet card. Now, Mike Schmidt, I think the only reason he got a Super Vet card is because it had been 10, like 11 years and he was a star player of the, of the day. So that's why they threw a Super Vet card in him. You know, because there's a couple other players. I really wonder why in the world would they have wasted a card on that guy? So Rich Gossage, he's on the borderline. He's certainly a Hall of Famer, certainly deserving of his Hall of Fame card. Same stats as Mike as far as length of play, if you consider that. Uh, he got a card. Here I start to really wonder what in the world. Kent to Colby, really? Uh, 10 total seasons, 10 total seasons with the Pirates. And he gets a Super Vet card. What in the world? Why are you thinking that? tops. I mean, what in the world, really? And then lastly, even though he's a Hall of Famer, Bruce Souter, he hadn't even been in the in the league 10 seasons by this time, and he's a super vet? What in the world? Sure, he's a Hall of Famer. Sure, he's good, but this is the person you create, you add to your super vet lineup? I mean, come on. Dave Winfield didn't get a super vet card. How come? He started in 73. There's a lot of players that didn't get Super Vet cards. Ricky Henderson, could he have gotten a Super Vet card? I don't know. It, it, it boggles the mind. Let me show you all a couple players who were in the league long enough that I think they, they were deserving of a Super Vet card. Gene Tennis. Catch your first baseman. Gene Tennis was with the A's in all three years that they won the World Series back in the early 70s. He started in 69. Gene Tennis was more deserving of a Super Vet card than either Bruce Souter or um, uh, Kent Ticolvi, probably more so than Dave Kingman even, to be quite honest with you. He started in the 60s. Another guy who probably deserved a, Hall of, uh, a Super Vet card, Paul Splittorf. Paul Splittorf started in 1970 with the Royals, had a quality career with them. You know, if you're going to throw a pitcher, why would you have thrown Paul Splittorf in there instead of Kent Ticolvi? Here's a really no-name player, Aurelio Rodriguez, third baseman of the White Sox at this time. But look at his career. He goes all the way back to 67. I mean, it doesn't matter that he's a journeyman. He's a veteran player. Why didn't he get a veteran card, Aurelio Rodriguez? I mean, seriously, think about the purpose of the card. Mickey Rivers. Mickey Rivers has been around since 70 as well. Was on some great Yankee teams back in the 70s. Won two World Series rings with them. Why didn't he get a Super Vet card? Toby Hara. Toby Hara was rated the best third baseman of the 1970s, I think, by, um, is either, was it, or was it the shortstop? He might have been the best shortstop of the 1970s as far as... Uh, um, MLB Network was concerned when they did the uh, top, you know, prime nine or something like that. They did the best of the 70s or something like that. Toby Hare made that list. Uh, and um, he started playing in, this six, in 1969 with the Senators. Why didn't he get a Super Vet card? Daryl Evans. Daryl Evans was around forever, and he started in 69. He hit over 400 home runs, dang near 500 in his career. Why did Daryl Evans not get a Super Vet card? Larry Heisel, designated hitter with the Brewers, but also had some uh, league-leading uh, home run years in his career, in his career, league-leading RBI years in his career. Uh, started with the Phillies, believe it, but he started back in 1968. All they gave was his careers. No, nothing, nothing cool about him. They just here's your stats, pal. Why did Larry Heisel not have a Super Vet card? Bill Russell, shortstop of the longtime Dodgers infield, started with the Dodgers in 69. This makes more sense than some of the players they included. Joe Rudy, another veteran of the A's World Series dynasty back in the 70s, along with Gene Tennis, 
started in 67, people. If you're going to do a subset and you're going to call it Super Vet, think about who goes, who belongs, whoop, I'm dying here, who belongs and who doesn't before you waste our time putting together a set like that, you know? And then lastly, Mark Belanger, utility shortstop of the Dodgers, along with Russell. Mark Belanger started in 1965, people. 65. He looks ancient. He looks like a veteran. And he didn't warrant a super vet card. What was Topps thinking? Sorry to rant and rave about that, but the, the Topps super vet... Um, was one of the, the things I really wanted to, to go over with you. So I have one last story about why 1983 Tops is my favorite. I've told this story a number of times. I've shown this card a number of times, but I'm going to do it again. So I have in my hand a 1983 Tops card, reserve catcher Glenn Brummer. Glenn Brummer had a forgettable career because I don't think anybody but me even remembers the man's name. Uh, he had a lot of up and down, a lot of minor league experience. He had 21 games with the Cardinals in 1981. He had 80, uh, 35 games with the Cardinals in 1982. Uh, hopefully he got himself a ring with the team. I don't know for certain, but hopefully he did. Glenn Brummer, the reason it's important to me is the 1983 top set is the first one I chose to complete. In other words, I collected cards as a kid from 80 and from 78 to 84. That's when I was actually buying packs as a kid. And I got out of it for a year. When I got back into it in the late 80s, um, I found the set that I had the most cards of, and I began going to card shops and shows and buying singles. This was back when you could still find dealers who had boxes and boxes of singles of the current year's cards. You don't see that too often anymore. Uh, you'll see singles of the vintage cards from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but you don't see too often dealers with like 5,000 count boxes just holding singles of 2023 tops. You don't see it. You did back in the uh, 80s and 90s. You had people who just dealt with commons. There was a, a card guru... I'm not sure if he's still around, called the King of Commons. But anyway, after a lot of work, I was down to one card I still needed, and it was this card, the Glenn Brummer. And I looked high and low for it, couldn't find anybody who had a, a, just a card. Then uh, at one show I was at, there was a person who was selling like a 3,000 count box of, uh, of what he called was, you know, unlooked and unsearched. And it was 1983 Topps cards. He wa he wanted to get rid of it. And he would sell it for 35 bucks at the time. Now, I was ready to buy that price. I said, listen, I'll buy it. But I need to know if this one card is. I'm looking for one card. I need to see if this one common card is amongst your things. Can I look? And he said, no, you can't. Well, I wasn't going to waste th my thinking back in the day. This is how stupid I was. Whenever I got cards as a kid, if I already had one, I threw out the rest. Literally. I never kept my doubles. I threw them in the trash. So who knows how many uh, Eddie Murray rookie cards I could have had. Who knows how many 79 Ozzie Smiths I threw out or Ricky Hendersons or what have you. Who knows how many doubles I tossed in the trash because I just didn't keep them. Anyway, Glenn, the guy wouldn't... wouldn't I was looking, I just needed the one card. I didn't care about the others. I wanted the one Glenn Brummer from the dealer. He wouldn't let me look through the box. So I moved on. On the way home, I found a card store. It's actually my my LCS to this day because of where I live now. But I found the card store in Quakertown. I asked the guy, I walked in there. I said, hey, you have this card, card number such and such. He went in the back, came back out, brought the card. I said, great, how much? A nickel. He told me it was a nickel. And I paid the nickel and I was gleeful. I was jumping around with glee because I had a 1983 Glenn Brummer. So that is my 1983 top story. That is the showcase of 1983 tops for you today. I hope you enjoyed that video. I do apologize for the length. I do greatly apologize, but I had to get through it. And I wanted to show off all the super vet cards and then complain a little bit about tops choice 
of who should be a super vet. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I, uh, please consider like, subscribing, commenting, and all that jazz. Uh, don't forget the trivia question again. Check in the description below for all the details there. Come back again Sunday. We'll be doing the trivia recap. I appreciate you watching. Uh, please continue to do so. I appreciate the support as I try my best to support everybody else in this great card community, okay? We will see you again on Sunday. Thanks for watching and take care.